Aloha, my name is Kale Furuya. Hi. <laughs> okay, take two. <laughs> I actually kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Kale Furuya. This is my dad, Chuck. Um, and we are here today shooting our first episode of Chuck Furuya Uncorked. Right. Um, this is a podcast uh, specifically designed to myst- demystify the world of wine. Um, and just focus on the pure enjoyment of drinking wine when you like to drink wine, when I like to drink wine, why you like to drink wine, why I like to drink wine. Um, just break down that world so it's not as... It's more reachable. It's more accessible to people, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, enjoying wine has been a lifetime for me, you know? And how can I convey that to all of you? Mm-hmm. You know, I want you to just reach for a bottle of wine instead of only vodka or gin or beer or sake. You know, what can we say here today that will inspire you to want to go out and try some wines. I like that. Mm-hmm. And how has that been for you? You've since you know since we started this whole adventure of trying to put together this podcast, and all the research that you've done. What is this all? What have you learned? What <clears throat> you know? Maybe you could share. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel I, you know like the two months leading up to us shooting this first episode, um, you had the two of us call um, some of your colleagues or people that you've worked with in the industry forever, your friends that you thought had something profound to share with me or with you or with us about me being able to understand the scope of what this podcast could be. Right. And when the conversation first came up to do this, to do that research, I was like, uh, I, I don't know, like, you know, I was really focused on the production aspect of this. And the audio. And the audio, or, and just, I was like, I don't really know how to edit. Like, I gotta, I, I'm, I'm trying to focus on that first. Like the the content was a second thought and, and more importantly, I didn't want to be on this podcast that I didn't envision myself being on this thing. So when the conversation came up of you ask, asking me to be on it with you and lead the first intro episode with you and that you thought it was important to make phone calls to people like Nuncio Ali, Uncle Nuncio, Ali Odo and Auntie Madeline Chafan and all these other people, I was like, hmm. Okay, and, and you know, you gave me a list of people to call like eight names and numbers to call. And I tried to call two people that I work kind of knew more personally by myself. And I was like, I have no idea what to talk to these guys about. Or like, I feel like I sound like an idiot. Like I have, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I didn't know how to go about that. And then you offered to jump on these calls with me to make it a little bit easier and more comfortable. And then all these aha moment breakthroughs happened. And um, I mean, you know, I work as a bartender currently at my family's re- at my mom's side of the family's restaurant, um, Buzz's Steakhouse, right on Kailua Beach. It's been there for 58 years. This current location, it's kind of like a little neighborhood staple, legendary, iconic, <clears throat> but neighborhood. And um, you know, we were talking to Uncle Nuncio, who's a master sommelier, and and according and to you, is one of your icons in the industry, and. Um, you were asking he, his son Alexander has a restaurant in San Francisco that's more of a bistro right style neighborhood, cap, neighborhood yeah, restaurant yeah. and you asked him you know like what are some of your favorite wines to pour at Alexander's restaurant and he answered with he loves pouring Ancient Peaks and three from, different ones has, three different wines from Ancient Peaks which is huge to have three of the same especially wineries. him Right. You know, you got to remember, he was chairman of the Court of Mass Sommeliers worldwide for at least 15 years. He's one of the most famous sommeliers in the world. So all of a sudden he blurts out Ancient Peaks and what happens to you? Well, he blurts out Ancient Peaks as well as Nyers, Zinfandel. And I'm, uh, Nyers has a couple other wines oh, yeah. besides Six, Zinfandel. at least. Six, Six or seven. So he's naming these two wines. Wineries. Wineries. And um, to me, I'm like, wait, we have Ancient Peaks at Buzz's and we have... Nyer Zinfantel at Buzz's and this masters and not only I mean before this conversation with Uncle Nunzio you would continually talk about yes. these wines and now he's talking about these wines and I'm like hmm I, I think I'm a pretty good bartender and I I'm pretty confident in my work and I was like I have no idea about any of these wines you know and um you know you would talk to me a lot about growing up when I, when we're growing up about being the best you can be at what you do and understanding your job to the fullest extent. Right. And I think that I understand my job pretty good. And I have no idea that ancient peaks or Nyers were 
wines that you or Uncle Nuncio would talk about, you know? And then it made me ask the question to myself, I don't, or it made me like question, like I don't know what I'm doing at Buzz's. Or not, not necessarily that, but like, I could understand my job better. You know, and, and serve your customers better, more information, more. Well, and to like, the, I mean, look at the labels. What do you have to say about the labels? I, and, and that was one of the things, you know, like I'm not trying to offend anybody <laughs> at all. But um, up until we started really putting this podcast together, I would buy and judge wines based off of the label, you know, and that ancient peaks. I mean, it's not not a great label but it's just kind of an unassuming label to the point where like you called it kirkland i did not call, so the backstory behind this <laughs> my dad's brother uncle neil had his 60th birthday <laughs> you don't have to go on to the story all right, all right well i did not call it kirkland but i thought that we had this family party and they had all these ancient peaks wines to give away at the end of the family party and my auntie was like, yeah, we got these from Costco. Like, take them home. And I was like, oh, all right, here we go. Like, I'm gonna, they're going to give me this wine to take home. That's fine. Um, and then leading forward to my job, I was like, this is a pretty unassuming label. You know, it's it's. I'm not saying that it's ugly or, or anything like that. but It's not it, eye-catching. Yeah. Can I just clarify that just for whatever it's worth? They didn't buy it at Costco, first of all. I helped them recommend the wines. <laughs> And the wines that they did get from Ancient Peaks, just so you understand clearly, was a different label. And it was one that I uh, collaborated on specifically for Hawaiian Airlines First Class International. That's what served in First Class. That's why it was called Pikaki. That's the name of first, Hawaiian Airlines First Class Service. So that's the wine they were giving away. It wasn't a Costco wine. It was just, and that label was intentional because I just want to keep it simple. You know, that, that was it. So you're assuming the blame. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, back, so back to this conversation with Uncle Nuncio, you know, he's talking about Ancient Peaks. He's talking about Nair Zin. Right. And that was the breakthrough is like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing with my job to the fullest extent that I could. Right. And, you know, if this is a career that I'm going to pursue and I'm, I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now and I finally feel like I, I know what I'm doing then I need to understand the world of wine a little bit better. Right. And, and especially my wine list. So that was a breakthrough like, okay, Buzz's Steakhouse is a, is a very family owned neighborhood restaurant and we do have wines on our menu that you no, or would, Uncle Nuncio yeah, are talking about. So exactly. it's not like an afterthought. Or would order if we came in. Yeah, so it's not an afterthought of like, I'm not putting in the time because I didn't think our wine list was anything special but now that we're doing all this research it is something special and it's it to me makes me feel more passionate about my job because we do have things to offer that are good right you know and then the other thing that i think i would like to ask you is by you talking to all these people i can see you buying all these wines to try i know you go visit our friend over there in kylo at our field wine company and you're asking him for all these really unreal wines that are family owned and operated you know like mm -hmm. these and you know, indigenous grapes and farm sustainably, et cetera, et cetera. What, what has that been like for you? So, <clears throat> you know, like through, through this research that we've been doing it, you're, you're right. And, and it's like, I am more interested in wine than I've ever been, you know? And, and that was kind of like the, the, uh, Launching pad. Yeah, for this. Kickstart. I mean, you know, and, and like it's something that I've wanted to, to look into and, and been interested in, but I've never really had the drive that I have now. So to answer your question, um, it's been amazing, you know, and, and it, it helps because my girlfriend Taryn is is really interested in wines now too that, I, that we've been having these conversations and you've been recommending things to bring home and um, we would hope that that's what happens after all of these talks with everybody and, and whoever's going to listen to this. And um, I mean, that was our big aha moment into like, this is cool. And I would drink wine in a lot of situations that I wouldn't before. And um, I'm more interested in cooking dinner at home and pairing it with something that's going to bring out the flavors and complement the food. So I think the point of the story is once you go down this path, I would say it's a fascinating world. Would you say that? A thousand percent. Yeah. So 
let me say this then, you know, so it's well documented that I'm a master sommelier and I'm this, 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 this. You know, that's secondary to me, you know. It, I just try to look at things and see how I can affect change. How can I get you down this path like this? And you, Luke, and you, Chris, you know, how can I get you guys to try wines? By the way, please pour yourself another glass of that wine. They're so like, yeah, we know. <laughs> so, 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 by the way, that wine is from Portugal. It's a light rosé, vino verde style, which means green wine. It's just a light, refreshing Portuguese wine. It's hard to get these kind of wines in temperature control here in Hawaii. So please enjoy it while we're, while we're talking. Okay, so that's the whole mission. How can I affect you? And, then how, and, and I think we were interviewing Chris Ramelb, who's a very famous sommelier in Hawaii, you know, and deservedly so. He is the, he is the man, right? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about people of his generation and your generation. Their first choice is liquor. Right? Their second choice, distant, is, is beer. Mm -hmm. And wine is like a very distant third. And so I'm sitting there going, wow, what can I do to affect that change? Because, you know, there's a whole world of wines to explore. It's so fun because there's families and there's all these different things involved, you know, a different sense of place, different soils, different climates, you know, and, and that's the whole point. You know, when you're dealing with family owned like this and, you know, it, it's just a whole nother sphere to explore. But here's the point that I just want to make clear, and you mentioned Bruce Nyers. And I would just like to take this opportunity to tell you, <clears throat> an aha moment for me was actually involving Bruce Nyers. So just to give you some history, Bruce Nyers is one of my wine yodas. Mm -hmm. He is like one of the all-time most brilliant wine minds uh, that I've ever met. I met Bruce back in the 70s. He said it was 1978, as you recall mm -hmm. when we were talking on the phone. And it was this very formal tasting that was happening in the Napa Valley, which I was fortunate to be selected to participate in. And Bruce was one of the people there, as well as all these other le legendary then Napa Valley icons, right? This is before Napa Valley was booming. You know, it, it, it was a different world. These guys were farmers. Okay, so here is a guy, 40 plus years in the Napa Valley, maybe 50, you know what I'm saying? And, and he was at Joseph Phelps, uh, winery in with the 74 vintage he conceptualized and launched that insignia bottle over there which is one of the most highly lauded lauded cabernets uh, cabernet blends out of the, out of california mm -hmm. the the 19 uh, excuse me the 2013 um, got 100 points from the spectator and parker so it's that kind of wine that was bruce who launched that thing that's what people don't understand so f 40 to 50 years in the napa valley Secondly, in 1992, Bruce Nyers became the national sales manager for Kermit Lynch Wine Merchants. Probably the most iconic wine importer of artisan, small, boutique, family-owned, uh, great estates from France and now Italy. That was Bruce. So he rubbed shoulders, walked vineyards, talked story, tasted wines with some of the, the world's greatest winemakers, artisan winemakers. Mm -hmm for 25, 26 years. So that's why I call him the wine yoda. He has so much knowledge, it's incredible. And as you know, when we were interviewing him, he doesn't volunteer things. You have to ask him questions, right? So, you know, but he has so much wisdom. He, he's like a kapuna, he's like this yoda, man. It's crazy for me. And every time I talk to him, I learn something new. So imagine this, it was August, one year. It was hot as hell, it was humid as hell. And Bruce, as you know, is rather large. And he walked into the restaurant and he was sweating profusely. And he was very agitated, to say the <laughs> least. He was ornery and he was, because I always tell my jokes to him, he don't like them. So he was glaring at me like, come on, try, try tell me a joke tonight, man. I'm, I'm all ready to tell you where to get off. He was in that kind of mood. And then the server came and he ordered a glass of this Beaujolais, mm -hmm. okay? And then he, uh, <clears throat> When the server's walking away, he excuse me, excuse me, come, come, come back. I need a large glass of ice. So the server went, and Bruce was just glaring at me. Come on, say a joke. Say, do something that, that's going to piss me off more. <laughs> and then when the server came, he took the glass of wine, and he just poured it over the ice. And then he covered it, and he went like this, shook it aggressively, so that the wine got very cold from the ice. And then he just downed it one time, like that, just downed it. And at the end, he put the glass down and just went, ah. And then he looked at me, you know, like, come on, say something, you know, something like that, you know, and, and essentially, you know, for me, this family here 
has owned and operated their vineyard for over 500 years. So think about that for a second. That's 1500s we're talking about. And it's been in the same family, passed through the generations for 500 plus years. Passed down from father, son, grandmother, the granddaughter, whatever, 500 something years. They passionately, organically, and biodynamically farm their vineyard, passionately. Not lightly, passionately. They don't add anything to the wines. They don't add yeast, they don't add sulfur, they don't take anything out, they don't filter, they don't find. You know, it's as natural-minded of a wine as you're gonna have, right? And it's not expensive, right? So This family has gone through all of this work mm -hmm. to produce this bottle of wine for over 500 years. And Bruce just downs it. So I'm thinking, I'm over looking ice. at him like over ice, <laughs> and he just downs it. And I'm looking at him, and he went, ah. Like, and then he became, smiled, and he became in a good mood. And he said, before you judge me, you know, you should try it yourself. So I, I got that glass of ice, and I tried the same thing that he did. And it was an aha moment for me, because really, it's not about the 500 years. It's not about being biodynamic and unnatural and all that stuff it's really about enjoyment that's mm -hmm. what bruce reminded me wine should be enjoyed so with you the, with the light bulb going on and with you too with the light bulb going on i just want to show you a different world it's like a box look inside imagine the possibilities of what can be without being expensive mm -hmm. you know just pure enjoyment so that whole thing here so you try this wine first of all Is it delicious? Delicious. Is it heavy? No. That's right. It's remarkably light, right? See how it flows so evenly and seamlessly from beginning to end? And does it finish oaky or alco alcoholic or bitter? No. So it's pure <clears throat> enjoyment. Is this a wine that you would label as gulpable? Absolutely. Or a country style wine? Absolutely. And what is a country style? Well, like, we'll go into that in a minute. I just don't want to veer away from this thing. I want you to look at this thing now. Brought this cup of ice. Put it over here. And we're going to shake it, just like Bruce did. And now you try it. Tastes different, right? It does. And it's not whiny, it's just delicious and, and thirst quenching, right? Mm -hmm. That was Bruce's point. And so before I turned on the AC just now, it was hot. I, I wish I left it off. Then you see how thirst quenching <laughs> this thing is. It was very hot. Yeah, but you'll see how thirst quenching is just like refreshes everything it makes it's uplifting it makes you and that's the point it's it's about the enjoyment of wine whether it's on the rocks or whether it's from Beaujolais or whether it's naturally made you know it, it really is about the enjoyment of wine that's mm -hmm. what I hope to communicate to everybody and that was an aha moment for me because of that so then from there it becomes because I am a master sommelier because I am this whatever people want to think you know there's naturally this in, this natural intimidation that comes with that territory. So, you know, I was, I saw John Weiss before this whole pandemic. Uh, and John Weiss is who? Remember he, Uncle John, he used to work with us at Fine Wine Imports. Mm -hmm. He's on Maui and he's just this guy I've known forever on wines. And he, he told, uh, he reminded me of a story over in Kailoa at a small neighborhood restaurant. I don't want to say the restaurant, it's non-existent today, but I was doing a staff training. And it was all these local kids and local, really local, local kind people, you know, and whatnot. So am I going to be a master sommelier or am I, am, am I going to try to open a door for them? And so the story he, t he tells is that I talked about Spam Musubi. There was a small Spam Musubi place uh, right by Keomoku and King Street, and they had all kinds of Musubis. So I would go there after I dropped you guys off to school. I would go there before I went to work to buy all these musubis and eat them along the way. So with the spam musubi that had a teriyaki glaze or a base on top, you know, so sweet and salty, I drank passion orange juice. The sweet, sour teeter-totter of that passion went really well and refreshed my palates between the, the sweet, salty teriyaki sauce. But with the Portuguese sausage and the salami musubis, I, it, it was too sweet. So what I drank with that was the Ituan unsweetened green tea. And tea, like coffee, has bitterness, naturally, because it's a plant. It's from plant-based. And so that bitterness, you know, really dealt with the fattiness and the saltiness of, that, of the Portuguese sausage and the salami. So 
when I told that story to these young people, they were like, wow, they could relate. Instead of me talking about this fancy wine with the, with the cream and butter sauce or this fancy wine with the red wine perigodine sauce, you know, they could relate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's the, that's what we need to try to do to get people more more and more people of your generations, three of you, down the path of enjoying wine, so they can have aha moments just like you. And so to build on that, what is a musubi? First of all, if you could explain, it, you it's know? like a it's like a rice. It's like a uh, it's not a rice ball anymore. It looks more like a, a rectangle, with spam on top, and then it's wrapped with nori just to hold it in place. And what a lot of people are doing now, they take this teriyaki sauce and reduce it. It's almost like a baste, and they just baste it on top so you have a little bit of teriyaki-ness that goes with the rice and makes the Spam taste more savory with the rice. So, you know. It's a staple here. It's like yep, something it's that's a staple. And you know what? I think uh, people have taken it a whole another nine yards in, in the fact that now you're seeing all these different kinds of musubi, some with the Spam and the teriyaki base, some with Portuguese sauces, some with salami, some with bologna. You know, it's pretty, some with tuna, I mean, it's just crazy. Would you how go chicken? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I think that the local people could, could uh, relate to that. <clears throat> I mean, hearing that story, you know, you've told me that story before, and that was, that was an aha moment. That is something that is like relatable upon relatable to, you right. know, to where, like you're saying, it's not pairing this wine that is from France that would, would be hard to find for an average person, or like, you don't know where to start. It's a musubi, which is something that is very common in Hawaii and paired with passion orange guava juice. <coughs> yeah, I, I just think that the bottom line is how can I make the viewer, how can I help the viewer to enjoy wines, to, to not make it so complex with the labels and, you know, you got to remember there's all this wine jargon and it gets more complex because a lot of it is foreign wine jargon. So now we got complexity built upon complexity built about complexity. So how can we get people just to try a bottle of wine just for pure enjoyment? And along those lines, the kind of wines I'm trying to show you, in addition to all of that, is ones that are family owned and operated and indigenous grapes, you know, from the area, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a heritage, a culture, you know, farming sustainably so it's a living vineyard. So there's many different layers to this thing, but the priority first and foremost is the pure enjoyment of wines. So what was one of the aha moments for you in terms of the pure enjoyment of wine? I would have to say that it was the first time I ever tried Lambrusco okay. with you. So just to let you all know, Lambrusco is a grape variety. It's indigenous to Italy and it's commonly found towards the, towards the east coast of Italy. And Lambrusco makes this red, light colored fizzy wine fizzy so it's it's an uh, abnormal it's not something that's you see commonplace or whatever and um it's typically served with salami and cheese why because salami and cheese is fatty and it's uh, salty right during the curing process of both so it's just something that's refreshing in between bites so for him who's drinking all these red wines and all these trophy red wines and chardonnays all of a sudden we're opening a fizzy Italian red country wine. Okay. <clears throat> and to talk about the first time I tried this, you know, and why it was such an aha moment for me. I mean, it was, it's, let me just take a sip of this first. To me, it is like drinking grape juice, but not in the extent of like you know talking talking about it's not so fruit forward fruit driven it's just so different it's effervescent and i know you know from talking to you that there's a lot of wines that are artificially fizzy or effervescent and aren't true to what you believe in and in, in style of making wine and it's the balance of something that is terroir driven and you can taste the muskiness and the soil of the wine. So terroir, just to clarify for the viewers, it's the concept of the Kula onion on Maui. There's something very unique about Kula Maui that results in a special onion. Neighboring Makawao and the rest of Maui for that matter, the onion's not as special. I don't know why, but I'm sure it has something to do with the soil. And so the soil and the growing conditions, everything results in, in, in a unique wine when it's done well. So this is like no other wine in the world. 
It's, it's certainly not like the Beaujolais, which is certainly not like the Nyers or the ancient peak wines. It's just, that's the fun of it all. So it's like experiencing Korean food or Mexican food. Why do you have to choose which is your favorite? Sometimes I'm in the mood for Japanese food. Sometimes I want the Italian food. That's the point. By knowing all these different options, now you can cho choose a wine based upon your mood, just upon how hot you are, what you're eating for dinner, you know, who you're hanging out with. You know, wine is great for conversations and just hanging out and talking story. Wine for picnics or maybe a lunch, mm -hmm. maybe a sit down dinner, maybe a formal dinner. So there's all these opportunities that you can enjoy wine. You know, today I was on the North Shore with Missy and Fred and, you know, two of our children and their, and their uh, our grandkids, they have three grandkids. And they were sitting there drinking wine on the rocks because of my story today. And uh, it was pure. No, no, Bruce? it was a different no. wine. But I mean, it was La Lacrima, as a matter of fact. The wine we're going to talk about the last thing. They were drinking Lacrima on the rocks. And it, would, it was something they'd never experienced before. But it was just pure enjoyment as we're sitting there. It's hot today, you know, and, and we're on the North Shore. And we're just talking story and, and watching the kids play and everything. It was the perfect enjoyment, you know, rather than a beer that's filling or a, a, a vodka and, or something or a tequila or something. And why is that, is like, you know, when, like, you're talking about all these aha moments and that's what drives, why does that drive you? Like, why is that something that you get so passionate and sparked up about? And that's what I feel like we're starting this podcast for. Yeah. You know, why is that so important to you? Okay, so uh, one year I received an honor and I just remember sitting there and thinking to myself, remembering all the people that touched my life to allow me to be here today to receive this honor. And in each case, it was somebody like Nuncio, Aliota, who's a master some way, to, it's like a box. Look inside the box, Chuck. When I looked inside, they said, now imagine the possibilities. Imagine what can happen now. So it's, it's, the, it's the thought process of, of learning to better enjoy, mm -hmm. not learning to show off and show I know more than you or whatever, whatever. <clears throat> you know, it's just... Uh, sharing the experiences, and, and, and that's the conversation with Bruce Nyers, or you, you talk to Amanda Wichstrom Higgins from Ancient Peaks, or Madeline Truffon. She was the first female in America to pass the Mass Film exam. She was number six overall, but she was the first female, the second female in the world. They didn't talk about their credentials or anything like that. There's normal people. Were they condescending? Were they trying to talk down to you about this or that? Mm -mm. No, it's a way of life. Wine can be a way of life, you know, and, and if you think about it, the basis should be pure enjoyment. All the other things can come later. But with Melissa and Fred and, you know, with all these people like yourself and hopefully these two here, you know, as they move forward, it's a box. Look inside, everybody. Now imagine the possibilities. And if this wine is like that, it's not just fruit. It's you, not. Can, you can taste the minerality from the soil that it's grown in. You know, it just comes with it. You know, it's just not overt, you know, but it's not fruity. You know, it's not just cherries, cranberries, strawberries. It's something earthy, something musky. And that comes from, I believe, the soil. Even though the scientists say it's not possible, it's possible, you know, to me. You know, and um, that's the point. It's just pure enjoyment. And the fact that this is one wine, that Beaujolais is another wine, the Nyers is a different wine, that's what makes it fun to me. You, well, you, and every year could be a different I mean, that's what you're talking about, right? Is every year is a different year for these wines and it's not always going to be the same. Every bottle could be different. So again, when do you enjoy this wine? You're hot. It's hot outside, man. You know, it's sweltering heat. Bruce Nyers, pour this on the rocks rather than having a cocktail, mm -hmm. you know, or serving it well chilled and just pouring and just gulping it down because it's so thirst quenching. It's so delicious. Now you're having a serious dinner. You know, and sit down and, and you cooked rack of lamb or you cooked a steak or something like that. That's where the Nyers wine comes into play. And what about Ancient Peaks? You know, same thing. It's the same kind of occasion. You know, it, it goes with marbled meats. You know, I don't mean to go off on tangents, but if you take a, a piece of meat and you marinate it in red wine overnight, mm -hmm. what happens to the meat is essentially gets tenderized. So part of the tenderization process includes the tannins, the pucker power, the stringency that comes from the grape skin seeds, stems, and the oak barrels breaks down the marbling and the proteins in the meat. That's why people say red wines with red meat. And the more marbling you see in the meat, like lamb and ribeye, the more tannins you need the corresponding wine. And the less marbling you see in the meat, like veal, pork, chicken, 
The less tannins, you need a corresponding wine. So of the four wines, which one is the one with the meat? Which one has the most tannins? It's those two. Now, which is the one that has the least tannins of all the wines you tried uh, for the chicken and the veal? It's going to be the Beaujolais. It's not tannic. It's not so bitter. It's not so, you don't need the marbling. And then just for light food like salami, cheese, uh, ahi, niswa salad, this is the perfect wine. Just mm. thirst quenching. So the point is, once you learn a little bit about each of the wines, then you can better understand when is the time, when is the occasion, when is the opportunity to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than studying that Menahunis pick these grapes at midnight or something, you know, <laughs> it's just it's just all about to me pure enjoyment. That's what I hope to convey to everybody. <clears throat> and to to build on that pure enjoyment conversation, you know, you keep talking about country style wines. What does that mean and and are these country style wines and why is that so important to you? Like let's talk about that for a little bit. Okay, so uh, two of the main categories of wines is the trophy wine. Which means what? You're going to put it away in the cellar for 20, 30, 40 years so yeah. that it has a chance to resolve itself and open up and show its glorious complexities. That's the trophy wines. That's the 100 point wines. That's all the, the big shots, you know, et cetera. How I define country style wines is simply the kind of wine that's served, commonly served in the cafe or bistros in the countryside of the Mediterranean Basin. You know, it's often served in carafes, not in bottles. You don't have to uncork. It's just served in well-chilled carafes. You just pour it. You eat the food. You gulp the wine. You wash it down with the wine. You know, it's not something you swirl and you go, Ugh. You, it's, not the, it's not the trophy wine at all. It just washes down the food. So how I envision or, or how I try to uh, describe those wines first and most they should be delicious now if we expect our foods to be delicious today shouldn't our wines be delicious as well and today not 20 30 40 years from now like trophy wines if we expect our foods to be lighter and fresher shouldn't our wines be lighter and fresher as well so Lambrusco Beaujolais light country refresh and they should be food friendly and last but not least they should be gulpable Gulpable means unoaky, unalcoholic, no hard edges. So it just goes down. It just goes down the gullet and washes the food down. And you can say, ah. Yeah, right, yeah. That, that's exactly what Gulpable. a country wine is for me. So both of these two wines are country wines, whereas these two are more for the tablecloth and everything. Every wine, you can drink it whenever you want. I'm not here to tell you when to drink it or not. But in order for me to better communicate the difference between the two, that's what I envision. So like here at Vino, we have some wines that are only by the glass. And we have other wines that belong on the bottle list. They're two separate programs. You know, the wines by the glass should be delicious, light, food friendly, gulpable, so that they go with our Mediterranean inspired foods. You know, at Sanse, with the contemporary dynamic Asian inspired foods, we got a whole different wine program there because it's a different kind of food. You know, and so it's about the pure enjoyment of, of it all. That's what we try to create, you know? Mm -hmm. And not so serious. So Vino being Vino Italian Tapas, your restaurant that we're currently filming at, Sansei being the sushi bar down in Waikiki. Waikiki. And one, well, pre-pandemic, uh, there was one in Kihei, one in Kapalua, and one in Waikoloa on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, they're currently not open because we've temporarily closed all of our restaurants during these times. And different menus. No, you know, all the Sanseis have uh, almost exact same menus. And where the difference is, is on the specials. The chefs are allowed to create specials based upon what fish they get, what, you know, what piece of meat they get, you know, some inspiration of, of a new preparation they thought about. So it allows them to create, you know, but as far as the sushis and all that stuff, the, the, the regular menu, it's uh, everybody, uh, everybody uh, offers the same food. And that's why, if I can just take a side tangent here, <clears throat> During this pandemic right now, we temporarily closed our restaurants. But all the executive chefs are here at Vino cooking. The Sansei executive chef, the DK Steakhouse executive chef, the Vino executive chef, the corporate chef, DK's making sushi with our head sushi chef. Ivy's here, Anne's here, all the GMs are here, you know, all the, all the, all the honchos of our corporation so that we can work together during these times, you know, make our culture strong and also, we can also look to tinker, because moving forward, restaurants can't be the same. Mm -hmm. So by doing this, we're, we're equipping, 
equipping our teams with the culture and the know-how of how we're going to move forward because it changes every day. So by working together, we, we address all these things every day and so that we can do it better. You know? So all the, the, this is a roundabout way for me to say to you, yes, the menus are the same, but culturally, I, I would say we're, so, we're very strong in that you know, the methodology of what we do, why we do it, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a very important thing as opposed to just measuring teaspoons of this and, and, and one quart of that. You know, so I think that's very important. And, 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 and again, because we do such high volume, you know, with these family owned things, I love it because the father and the son are making the thing. You know, Ancient Peaks is three, it's in Paso Robles, the southern part of Paso Robles, a very unique place. It's three ranching families. They're cowboys, they ride horses every day. You know, and so, you know, they, they created the vineyard so they, 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 they don't want any uh, members of their family to, in the future to feel like they need to sell off pieces of their land for these large Home Depots or whatever the case may be. So that's why they're trying to make a vineyard, help pay for the land, a zip line, pay for the, they still raise cattle and horses so that the land pays for itself. As you know, Nyers owns a, 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 quite a unique ranch in the uh, eastern part of the Napa Valley in what's called uh, a little niche called the uh, Con Valley and it's all organically farmed etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's just Barbara and Bruce and their winemaker who is sensational his name is Tadeo Bochart I was on the phone with him today these are personal wines I remember with the 1992 vintage Bruce we did this big tasting at the Holly Kalani and Bruce had a bottle on his table and he goes Chuck I have a wine for you to try and he poured it for me it was the single best Merlot I've had it was a Nyer, it was his first 1992 Nyers Merlot that he made himself. I was blown away. And the relationship has continued since then. Ancient Peaks, I chased him for four and a half years. Cheryl and I would stand outside the gate, hi everybody, hi everybody, <laughs> and nobody would come to talk to us. No, no, they didn't want any, they're ranchers, they're cowboys. They so I called everybody and I emailed everybody and texted everybody in the region, please help me open that door. It took four and a half years to open that door, you know? That Beaujolais, we, we first brought that wine to Hawaii in the uh, late 80s, you know, and it's just, I carry it here at Vino and, and at Sansei, we do it by the glass for how many years? Because it's so darn good and it's so personal. It's so delicious and food friendly. You know, the, that, that wine is made from a grape variety called Gamay Noir. They've genetically proven that Gamay Noir is a descendant of Pinot Noir. That's why it has umami. That's why it's delicious. And what is umami? Umami is like deliciousness. It makes things super delicious, you know? And so th that grape in this wine innately has deliciousness and food friendliness. <clears throat> so if you could relate each of these wines to a clothing brand or a style of car, let's go through that. So it's relatable to our guests, you know, like. So the Ancient Peaks to me is a pickup truck. You don't care Heavy if it gets lifting. dented. You don't care if it's the kind, and you're you're off roading. You know, you you just you just you know, it's just built to last. It's just solid, earnest blue collar. That's Ancient Peaks wines, mm -hmm. and they greatly over de deliver for the dollar. You know, it's not the latest Maserati or something like that. That's not these kind of wines. <clears throat> it's just earnest. You know, every day, like great value for your dollar. You know, I mean, it's just something that. You know, for, for the listeners, you know, I see it in all these stores. That's one that, and rather than all these pretty labels and all these things, zero in on Ancient Peaks wines. Nyers is like one of the stands out, standouts of California, period. It may not get the super high scores, but I don't care. The wines are worldly. They lie somewhere between California and Europe in style, in philosophy, in methodology. You know, Bruce combines what he learned in the uh, uh, Napa Valley uh, 40, 50 years with all the things that he's seen, learned, experienced in France and Italy, mm -hmm. and they combine it. So these wines are otherworldly, you know, and they're more about elegance. They're more about class. They're not showy. They're not uh, flamboyant. You know, they're not snazzy. It just unreal good, just unreal good. Beaujolais is a country wine. Beaujolais, therefore, would be like maybe a scooter. You know, Vespa. <laughs> you just go around and it's just like you could park it wherever, you know, you go to the beach. You don't care if you're still wet with the seawater, whatever. It's just total casual and total delicious. But, you know, it's, it's a family that's been doing it for 500 years. So there is a seriousness to the thing, but their intent is not to make something serious. It'd be like 
you know, maybe the Nyers is like Alan Wong, something world class, whereas <clears throat> the Beaujolais is more like Alan Wong or DK doing plate lunch. Mm. You know, it's just For the good people. food, yeah. good, you know, thing, but reasonable. You know, and, and you could eat it in front of a TV. You could eat it out at a picnic. You know, I mean, it's just... Microwave ver- it, play it's, it, yeah. it. It's it's versatile. Lambrusco is just pure enjoyment. I mean, you like walking on a spring day in a meadow field. It's not driving a car. It's not a brand. It's just about the feeling of being in open air amongst all these flowers and feeling the sunshine and the cool spring breezes and whatnot. And it's just pure enjoyment, pure thirst quenching you know, et cetera. It's just about that. Now, I would have to say this in each of these cases, but specifically the Lambrusco, there's a lot of Beaujolais available. There's a lot of Lambruscos available. But you have to, in my opinion, be very selective. Both, all of these wines are brought to Hawaii in temperature controlled uh, containers, you know, and that's very important. So it, <clears throat> let's say it's coming from France or Italy. It takes four weeks, five weeks to come here. Those containers get to be 100 degrees inside, over 100 degrees. That's like taking your bottle of wine, stick it in the oven, right? 110 degrees times for four weeks. The wine gets cooked. If, if it was a piece of fish, it'd be cooking 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand, that's why people mm-hmm. say, oh my God, man, this wine doesn't taste like how I had it when I was in Italy. And so, <clears throat> the, especially Lambrusco has a shelf life. It's like beer. You can tell when it's, when it's turning. It's, it's a very fragile wine, you know, so you have to be very uh, attentive to how you store it, how you ship it, et cetera, et cetera. So you, the whole, that's why I'm so selective in finding, this was a special order for us because it's, I wanted something fresh and exuberant like this and, and still had the fizz and still had the life, not dull, you know, from temperature control issues or whatever. This is fresh and alive. Same with that Beaujolais. And to talk about this, Lambru- like, like you know, this Lambrusco's color and flavor and pigment is way different than that first Lambrusco. Sometimes it can be dark red. Sometimes it can be a little lighter. Like, why? It's just how they make it. You know, it's just how much skin contact it has. Because if you think about it, 90-something percent of the grapes, you know, the juice is clear. If you peel the skin off of a black grape, in most cases, 90-something percent, the juice is clear when you, when you squeeze the pulp. Where the color is, is in the skins. And when you bite into the skins, the skins are bitter. So when you leave the skins onto the wine as it's fermenting, the rising alcohol levels leaches out the color and leaches out the bitterness. So you have, it gives it flavor, but you have to be careful if you want to manage bitterness. It's because this wine has no bitterness. The Beaujolais has very little bitterness, so it's managing all of that. But what this wine does slightly have is that raisiny character that is it patriotis or no what? it's just uh it's just juicy ripe you know i mean if you look at the alcohol i bet you it's only like 10.5 or something like that can i see that that bottle my eyes are so bad now it's, it's only 11.5 alcohol so instead of 13 14 15 degree alcohol you know so it's just light and fresh it's meant to be consumed just like your rosé guys that's called Vino Verde, green wine. It's meant to be consumed young, fresh, alive. You want the vitality. You want the uplifting qualities, the nuances of that. Same thing with the, with the Lambrusco and the Beaujolais. You want these. And the other thing that, that, that Vino Verde and Lambrusco and that Beaujolais offer is, I mean, in a store, gosh, we're talking about, you know, for the Lambrusco, maybe $15 a bottle. Wow. You know, the Vino Verde, maybe $14 a bottle. That Beaujolais may be $18 a bottle, you know, which I think is very reasonable. <clears throat> and you could find these at... Well, that's a difficult thing. <clears throat> that's the challenge. <clears throat> Most stores, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the main criteria of why they carry things is based upon how many times the scans a week. So another way to look at that comment, if X amount of bottles don't sell, it's out and a new brand comes in. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's olive oil, soap, shampoo, that's just the way the world's going. You know, it's about... You know, we have to generate revenue to pay for the square footage and whatnot. So who's going to come in and say, oh, you have the Lambrusco? <laughs> oh, you got the De Pubel Beaujolais? <laughs> you know, it's not possible. So that's why you're not going to see it. They're, they're not commercial brands. They, they don't have marketing dollars. They're just families, you know. And so Ancient Peaks, Nyers, they don't have a huge marketing budgets or anything like that. So they're not named brands, you know. So that's why 
When you go to uh, Foodland Kailua. Our fields, Kailua specifically. Yeah. Right? And who do you talk there to? Keith. There? Okay, so Keith works with us two days a week. Of the four levels of the Master Sommelier program, Keith is level two. And he's the wine buyer. And he comes fields. here to work two nights a week just to be about around wines. So that's why, if, you know, these kind of wines he's going to carry more often than not because he's got that passion. He's got the, he's going to recommend it to you just and, and to Melissa and, and everybody else that goes in there. Well, you and know? to build, on, like you talking about Melissa going there is she goes, she makes it a point to save money to go there how many times a few times a month to to spend the money to Hoko buy the wines. too yeah they, which is cool too i think that's great yeah and and if you really think about it okay so this this lambrusco let's say it's 15 dollars, and let's say you want to drink it over the rocks right how much does a bottle of vodka cost today mm -hmm. you know or how much does the does a, does a bourbon you're gonna cost? pay 15 dollars a shot at some places well i'm just trying to say you know not only is enjoyment important but it gives you another option that you can enjoy something that's not so alcoholic. You're not going to get ripped on it after two glasses. And Pretty you're well. getting great value. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's another well, important and, point. And to talk about the price point, I don't think necessarily the price point of wine is what makes it scary. Or like, you know, for me, you know, I'll talk about it. Like I would buy wines based off of labels or recommend wines based off of labels. The scary part of it is that it is kind of like coffee in the world of there's people that you know, will drink any kind of coffee. And then there's people that are know what they're looking for. Right. So we have a wine of the week, if you could talk about that. Okay. And to bridge the gap on hopefully to make this more of a comfortable talking point to break down the label that you did the other week. Okay. So that is more relatable. It's not, you know, like you're not looking at this <clears throat> wall of wine that is like, you, where do you start? <clears throat> right. Okay. So the first thing I'd like to say before we look at these labels, <clears throat> I like to categorize things so I can understand it better. So two of the categories of wines that are out there to me is the New World and the Old World. Okay? New World includes California, Washington, Oregon, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, just to name some. Those countries, for the most part, in many cases, I shouldn't say all cases, but in many cases, they name their wine after the grape variety. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Zinfandel, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, et cetera, et cetera. When you smell and taste a New World wine, often times you're going to smell the grape variety. Mm -hmm. Apple, pineapple, pear for Chardonnay, you know, black cherry, uh, cranberry, plum for the red wines. You know, and those characteristics mainly come from the grape variety itself. Cabernet has its own profile of, uh, of typical aromas, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing with Sauvignon Blanc. So, you know... <clears throat> You know, although there is t uh, soil influences in many cases, I'm saying generally speaking, you know, th they're more about the grape variety. Whereas those from France, the old world, France, Italy, Germany, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Austria, et cetera, those countries, they tend to name their best wines after the place, not the grape variety. So their focus is the place, not necessarily the grape variety. And they've had centuries to find out where those plots of, special plots of land are. So that's why it's very significant, especially on the top end, of site-specific wine. So you know exactly where you're, you're getting your, your grapes from. Mm -hmm. You understand? So in those cases, in my humble opinion, I'm not saying all, but many, you know, you smell more about that sense of place. Right? So, so therefore, uh, <clears throat> it's just a different take on wines. Now, you can have fruit-driven French wines and... Uh, Italian wines, but and you can have terroir-driven, more soil-driven California, Washington, Oregon, et cetera, et cetera, wines. I'm not trying to make a blanket statement because there's never one answer. I'm just saying for the average listener, that's generally, I'm um, typically what what you experience. Okay, so in the case of this wine, this wine comes from uh, the eastern part of Italy, facing the Adriatic Sea, in an area called Marche. It's, it's spelled like marches. Okay, it's facing the Adriatic Sea on the east coast of Italy. Most of the wines that you probably know from Italy are from the west coast. And if you look at Italy from north to south, it's dramatically different. Mm. The terrains, the temperature, the soils. It, Italy is not one country. It's so diverse. It's crazy. So to expect all Italian wines to taste the same, you know, it, it's, unless it's commercially made, you know, th there's going to be huge differences between all the different sub-wine-growing regions. Okay. This wine, interestingly, 
the appellation is called lacrima. How do you spell that? L A C R I M A. Lacrima uh, de Moro de Alba. Okay? That's the name of the appellation. That's what the government approved as saying this wine is unique and noteworthy to be its own wine. You know, it's taken a long time to get it approved through the Italian government process, but this wine has its own appellations, its own approval, as long as you follow the geographic delimitations and uh, the stringent laws that they have on the production of this wine, the standards. So that when you smell and taste a wine, this is definitively La Crema de Moro de Alba. So like champagne can't just be... No, champagne is a specific area and they have their own laws determining how it's made and what can be grown, the yields of of, of grapes per vine, all that stuff is is all documented. And is that something that places like California and New World... Yes, but, but, but it's, it's slightly different mm-hmm. in that thing. I don't want to confuse. I just want to talk about this and not get unfocused. We can talk about that in another episode. Okay. So when the La Crema de Moro de Alba appellation was approved, finally approved in 1985, I was told there was still only two producers growing and making that wine. So it's, it's a nearly forgotten grape variety. It's a nearly forgotten appellation. You know, and now I was told there's seven to nine producers, depending on, and other people are buying grapes from the area now and stuff. So it's it's kind of building. The grape variety specifically is called Lacrima. Mm-hmm. That's the name of the grape. This other part is just more of the name of the appellation, and I don't want to get too complex, but it's it kind of tells you where the wine is from. You know, it comes from this one delimited area on the east coast of Italy. Okay, but Lacrima is the grape. Okay, the the reason why this wine caught my fa- oh, and the producer is Luigi Giusti. That's his name. His son actually runs the domain now, but the name of the label is Luigi Giusti. And you spell that how? Luigi, Luigi is spelled L-U-I-G-I, and Giusti is spelled G-I-U-S-T-I. Mm-hmm. Luigi Giusti. What, the reason why this wine caught my imagination or my fancy was the fact it has wonderful aromatics. So it's just like what we were talking about, the white wines the last time. You know, these aromatics, they smell like it could have sweetness to it, but they're not, they're dry. But what these aromatics, grape varieties do is they uplift foods, just like fresh herbs do. So imagine having a tomato salad. You have the tomato, salt, pepper, and olive oil. If the tomato is good and the olive oil is good, you got a great tomato salad. Mm So imagine having that same tomato salad with torn basil or torn shiso. The aromatics, the methylene quality of the shiso or the the basil uplifts the thing and makes it taste that much more dynamic, that much more exciting. That's what these aromatic grape varieties can do. So instead of black cherry, black plum, black thing, this thing has a rose petal, like cranberry, like Suriname cherry kind of things that are very uplifting not just dark and, and, and earthy and stuff like that. So the, the dynamics with a piece of pizza or the dynamics with a meatloaf or the dynamics with these foods, you know, bolognese, it's going to be very different just because of the aromatics. And so it was just hard to find a good one. And this is it. You know, uh, Lacrima di Moro de Alba. And it's just a different take on an Italian country wine that will work magic at your dinner table. You know, it's pure enjoyment but it's just magical. This is your recommendation of the week. It is. And how much would you expect to pay for this? $20 a bottle. Amazing. Maybe I would estimate $20 a bottle. So that's what Missy and uh, Fred and Cheryl were drinking today on the rocks. She bought it at our field wine company in Kailo. (laughs) Isn't that funny? So. Here, let's open it, and you and you tell me, Kali. You don't drink have to that. open that if you, you want. Well, to. you might as well drink it. They might as well try it. Well, because right. if, if it's the wine of the week, the, true, they should know what to kind of expect. Mm-hmm. Like they down that glass right yeah. there. <laughs> Honestly, I've been looking for Lambrusco forever. Like I'm so happy. I was like, oh, you guys got it. <laughs> There's not very many good ones here in Hawaii. You know, you have to be very, very, <laughs> very for, selective. Well, and to tell a story about that. So after that first time I tried that brusco that we were talking about earlier, I would come into Vino's all the time. And a lot of times we would have these dinners here, 
or we would like organize some kind of dinner party and I would show up a little early to make sure that everything's set up and I would sit at the bar and the bartender would ask me like, hey, what do you want to start to drink? I was like, I want a glass of Lambrusco. And they'd be like, oh, we don't have it this week. You know, like, and I was like, what do you mean you don't have it this week? Like, how do you, <clears throat> you know, so it, it is hard. They don't carry it all the time, you know, and. And the more important thing, it has to be fresh. Yeah, so my, I only got into the Brusco this oh, year. Man. And it's because uh, Regal carries it. Regal? Yeah. On a uh, well, Hulu. Yeah, but they carry... Uh, oh. I don't want to say. Oh, I don't want to come We'll edit this out. Is that the La Crema? Yeah. La Crema. La Crema. La Crema. It's like saying kale. <laughs> <laughs> are we recording this? Yeah, we, we should. Are. We are recording oh, yeah. this. It's still recording. Good. <laughs> we'll cut out the parts that we'll no, you should include this stuff. This is about pure enjoyment. Cheers. <clears throat> I'm not there yet. Okay, Luke, Cheers. you tell me what you think about this wine now. La Crema. La Crema. La crema. No, La Crema. La Crema. Say La. La. La Crema. So what do you smell there that's different from your typical red wine? Let him smell first. It smells like... Rubbery? Rubbery? Wow, that's a new one. Leathery. Leathery, leathery maybe, yeah. yeah okay. Leathery. <clears throat> Do you get the floral component? <clears throat> so, you know, like when we're t when you know you and and Chris oh. Romelb talk about aromatics, I'm like, what is aromatics mean? And tasting this wine, I kind of understand what you're talking. Like, it has that floral, fruity smell, and you're gonna like. To me, when I first smelled this. I'm like, oh, it's going to be sweet. It's going to taste like fruit. And it does not at all. Yeah. That's what you're talking about, about yeah. aromatics. You can see how uplifting the aromatics are. It's not just earthy and dark and rank and all and that stuff. And when you drink the wine, you, so what I can relate it to essentially is when we were talking about earlier of, you know, you, I've been asking you what wines to buy and whatnot. And so I've been cooking dinner at home a lot. I got an Instapot. And, every, and my girlfriend works a lot. She's a, a veterinarian surgeon. So I so, try to prepare food for her, for us for like at least three nights out of the week so I don't get lickings, you know. And um, which is often when I'm asking you for recommendations on wine. And the whole day I'm like thinking about what I'm going to cook. I'm planning out my dinner. And then I'll start cooking. And by the end of me cooking, I'm not hungry necessarily. I have a hard time like cooking food and like spending a couple hours in the kitchen and then sitting down and be like, okay, I'm hungry and eating it. But asking you these recommendations, I'm cooking and I'm smelling what I'm cooking and I'm preparing the sauce and I'm dipping my finger in the sauce and tasting it. And from your recommendations, I'll open up, you know, one or three bottles, whatever you recommend, and I'll try it as I'm cooking food. And that's what I'm relating this to. So I'm smelling the smells, you know, the other week. I ordered, I, I was cooking chicken piccata and I asked you for a recommendation. You recommended a couple different Rieslings. And that's what I'm relating to. I'm smelling and I'm tasting little bits of the piccata, but then I'm tasting the wine and understanding what you're talking about pairing it. You know, another secret, if, you, if you're cooking like a tomato sauce with this, for this wine, something with tomatoes and stuff, uh, you just grab the bottle like this at the last moment. Just, you put your finger over it like that and you just go like this. L little bit drops not not gush drops like you just go like this and, and you dot the top and you just mix it in and th that'll make the pairing even more mm. interesting and you can more do that with dynamic the or anything yeah exactly just and you don't want to burn off the alcohol necessarily you can if you want you just go like this you're finishing just, it yes essentially it's, that's how olive oil is supposed to be used the real extra virgin olive oil is you finish it with the olive oil you know because when you cook it, you're, you're burning it. You're, 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 you're changing it, you know? So just do that with the wine. Just put your finger on the top of just a couple drops here and there, you know? And just mix it in. Oh, man, I tell you, it's going to make a d huge difference to you. <laughs> and the other thing I would do is I would just, you know, be careful on your seasoning. But the last moment before you serve, just grab a pepper mill. Coarse, coarse, not fine. Coarse cracked pepper, just like, like that. That's it. You're gonna see, man. Wow, what a difference, man. To make and, it and, more and, and, wine friendly as well. 
Yes, but I mean, it just makes the, you know, it's, it's kind of like you're starting, you're starting the, uh, the wine and food dynamic happening. You know, just from blending it in, you're, you're starting that experience of the wine and the food going together by doing that. And the pepper makes tannins and alcohol less obvious. Mm. You know, and less glaring, I should say. So it's a little secret for when you're cooking at home. So to build on the pure enjoyment of wine, I feel like we should leave a little bit of time to ask Luke and Chris about this. Yeah. I want to hear what they said about last week's wines. Oh, actually, you didn't, you didn't describe the body and the finish. So the body of this wine, so just so you understand what I think body is, body is the weight or the feel of the wine on your palate. Okay. And so the best, simplest example I can give you is which one has more body, skim milk or whole milk? Whole milk. Okay. That's what body is. It's the weight. It's the feel of the wine in your mouth. So to me, for a red wine, this is light to medium to medium in body. Okay. And then um, what was the other thing you asked me? Uh, finish. The finish, it's long. Look how long it stays on your palate. You know, but more importantly than the finish... This wine flows very evenly and seamlessly from beginning to end. Too many wines are front loaded with nothing in the middle and alcohol and bitterness in the finish. This wine flows so evenly. Same thing with the Beaujolais, same thing with the Rosé, uh, same thing with the, uh, <clears throat> the Lacrima de Moro d'Alba. It flows so evenly and seamlessly from beginning to end. And, and that's a really good wine. So uh, can I tell you a little story about that? Yeah, 100%. I, I did this event in Montana you know, with very upscale chefs. I mean, very. So the last time I did it, two of the chefs won the TV show Top Chef. And the other ones won, won James Beard Award. So it's really five highfalutin chefs. <clears throat> this is in Montana in January. I don't know who these chefs are. I don't know what they're cooking. I never saw any menus. So and how the hell am I going to pair the wines <laughs> with the food? Right? So I have to be proactive about this. So... Starting in August, because it's Montana, you're not going to be able to get wines shipped to Montana in January or December. It's too cold, it's snowy, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I had to start thinking of, of the wines that I would do in August, even though I never saw any menus. Okay, so <clears throat> the way it worked was I had to use my imagination. So I sat there thinking, what kind of meat they're going to use in Montana in January? Or probably beef, it's readily available probably lamb, it's readily available, right? And so heavily marbled meats. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to get some tannic wines, right? Well, because it's Montana, they might use buffalo. They might use venison. Mm -hmm. They might use elk, leaner meats. So I have to select less tannic red wines, right? You because understand? they're leaner cuts. Le yeah. Leaner, not so much marbling. What kind of fish they're going to use in Montana in January? Probably trout. wild trout, mm -hmm. wild salmon. And maybe Arctic char, because these chefs are all high standing, Arctic char was really happening, right? So I had to select wines for each of those. So the best way I can describe to you the next step was, I imagine I had to select wines that were like a tree, like this. Just a tree, freestanding. No branches. No oak, no alcohol, no bitterness, no branches. And nothing that's going to clash. Yeah, so that it flows very evenly and seamlessly like these wines are to, to you. Now, if the chef is that good, which they are, they're mm -hmm. world-class, then their food should be very well-balanced as well. So no branches, no overt spiciness, no overt saltiness, no overt sweetness, you know, so mm -hmm. that the two trees could line up easier, right? And then I felt like when I got there, uh, then the chef and I would work in the kitchen and we would make the pairings even that we would, we would compromise. And I'll tell you that, in, that story in a minute, but... The whole point of the story of it flowing very evenly and seamlessly and completely from beginning to end is that tree. That's what I'm looking for. Rather than concentrating on the finish, which is what Chris is asking me, i rather concentrate on how it flows from beginning to end because that will set me up better for the dinner table, lunch table, picnic, etc. You got it? So like cheese. Cheese is salty. Cheese is fatty. So now, because it has branches, I have to think of wines that's going to complement that. Hence, light, fruity, fizzy, like the Lambrusco. Mm -hmm. You know, you understand what I'm saying? And if the meat has a lot of marble, then I have to choose, that's a branch. Then I have to choose wines that are tannic, you know, that pucker power, that astringency, so that it could 
meld in with the food and make the food taste that much better and cleanse my palate between bites like what the iced tea did for the Portuguese sausage mm -hmm. and the salami. So I have to change uh, the trees based upon what the food <clears throat> is or what the wine is. But you have to select your selection that is versatile. Yes. Where you can make those changes yes. on the fly, essentially. So as an example, uh, Josea Rosen... Berg, I think his last name was, Top Chef, season five winner. Rosen, Rosenberg, I think it was his last name. A great guy, great chef. Wow. So <clears throat> one of his dishes was a uh, apple cider braised pork with uh, flathead lake cherry sauce and uh, some type of puree. It was a butternut squash puree. So if you think about it, apple cider will make it sweet, right? Butternut squash is sweet, and flathead cherries are sweet. And when you reduce it, it's even sweeter, right? So what sweetness clashes with is oak, alcohol, and bitterness. Mm. It makes alcohol taste super alcoholic. It makes, makes bitterness and tannins taste super bitter. So, you know, to... to, to to serve a red wine with those dishes for the gala dinner, you know, most people wouldn't notice, but I will, and those chefs will, you know, so I had to, so, so he was, thankfully, he was so willing to collaborate, so how can we make the dish better? So instead of just using cider, we also added jus to the braising. A jus? Jus, yeah, just the pork jus, so that it was more savory. And then for the, uh, the, uh, uh, a squash puree, a butternut squash puree. He grilled it first, so it marked, mm. so it gave it savoriness and bitterness. And then he smoked it for two or three hours to give it more savoriness, as opposed to so it was no longer just sweet. It had savory components to it. And then for the flathead cherry sauce, most people would take the cherry, squeeze it so it's the juice, and they're going to reduce it so so that it's more cherry, more intensely cherry, but at the same time it's sweet. So what we did instead was we made a savory sauce. To that, at the last moment, we added the cherries. You understand? So mm -hmm. it's much more savory. So that's how you can work with the chef to mitigate the clashing and create even a better pairing than just the tree formula. But the, it all starts from the food and the wine, understanding what the tree is for each. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? So, so when I taste wines, I only, don't only taste it whether it's good or not. But I also, in, in, in when I said, I also, as a sommelier, want to understand what kind of foods to pair with it, I try to analyze it, how is it stack up as a tree. And by ha seeing a wine that flows very evenly, seamlessly, and completely from beginning to end, that's the tree. That's what I'm looking for. So if I select a lot of wines like that, I'm good to go when I, it's time to approach foods. Mm -hmm. I'm better equipped. And also, you have that relationship with your chef that you can make those small yeah, changes absolutely. to. Yeah. So his name was Josea Rosenberg. Jose, yeah. yeah, Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Yeah. He's a great chef, man. And, uh, and Brooke Williamson was there as well. She's another top chef uh, winner. Man, those two, there were so many great chefs at that event. It was, pretty, it was pretty awesome for me, working with these. I'm very fortunate over the years to work with all these chefs, whether it's Bengali food or whether it's uh, foods from India or Jamaica or soul food from Chicago. I mean, it was just... The opportunity to work with all these chefs and all the different ingredients and all the different techniques and everything they cook, it was a it was an incredible learning opportunity for me over the years. And then this Jose and, and Brooke took it to another level because I had to think about it in August when the event wasn't until January. So how much of those like relationship or those um, you know run-ins with these kind of people affected your? methodology or ideology about pairing one of it and i asked this because that time that i was making piccata at home and i asked you for your recommendation of on what wine i should pair with i went to a wine shop and i was like hey i'm looking for a german riesling i'm i'm making chicken piccata for my girlfriend tonight like what german riesling would you recommend and they're like first of all that's an interesting recommendation and i was like why and they're like you know it's an italian dish but you're asking for a german wine so like it was very out of the box how like why is that or how is that or you know and what did you answer 
I was like, I, I don't know. This My dad just told me to come to and find a German Riesling. And he was, he, you had texted me. He's like, you're like, hey, I have a German Riesling at my house if you want to stop by. And I was like, I'm going to buy my own wine. I know, I, like, I'm going to go and try to find what I'm on my path to find to pair with. You know, like, I'm going to try to do this on my own. And I went to that wine shop and they're like, we wouldn't pair. Or not we wouldn't pair, but they're like, oh, that's interesting pairing a German wine with an Italian dish. So how much of these run-ins with these other sh- or these worldly sh- or, or can you just talk about that a little bit? Of okay, like- so first of all, the first question I have for you, which wine went with the dish? Yours. Okay, by a small margin? No. Okay, so <laughs> the point I'm trying to say is that... No, no smart margin at all. And, and okay, so this brings up several interesting points, therefore. Number one, the Australian Riesling that he recommended to you is really world class in its own right. It's really a standout wine. You know, uh, whether it's a standout as the Riesling I, from Germany I gave you is another story, but it is world renowned, right? So he didn't, he didn't steer you wrong, wrong on yeah. that level. And you have to understand- And the price point wasn't crazy either. So th- th- it was a good experience for you. And, and the whole thing for me is just that, I don't think I know more than anybody else. But I've been afforded all these opportunities of working with a Bengali chef or a, uh, you know, a, a Singaporean chef, Balinese chef, Argentinian chef, Brazilian chef, and pair wines with the food. So it comes from hands-on experience, not theoretical. Mm-hmm. You know, and so you, I, I look at the dynamics of your dish. Because that picata had a little bit of sweetness because it had high acid, all these things. Those are branches. So I had to mitigate the branches. So I had to select a wine that would offset the branches that you have inside the food. Mm. So whether it's from Germany or whether it's from Italy was besides the point for me. Because of what you described as the preparation, I had to mitigate the branches in order for the pairing to match up better. You understand? It's just like Hosea was kind enough to, you know, grill uh, the butternut squash to give it marking and to smoke the butternut squash to help mitigate the branches so much so so the wine would fit in better. It's the same exercise. It's just that, and, and, and it's just, I've just been given that opportunity to learn about these things hands-on. You know, it, it, I, I, you know it's, it's just something that, that, that you can only learn from hands-on experience, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think that that was kind of an aha moment in like when you talk about you know, this Beaujolais is different from this Nyers, is different from this Ancient Peaks, is different from this um, Lambrusco, and that every year they're all different. And then, like, now we're talking about pairing wine, and, and I'm going into this store, and they're like, mm, that's a weird recommendation. Like, who did you, you know, that it is just so many variables to where now I'm understanding what you're talking about. You, you know, you say often when I ask you, why wine it's your answer a lot of the times is you'll never understand wine completely like you're all you're continually learning you'll never reach a point where you know everything exactly and that is was a breakthrough aha moment for me to where like he's right and and like you said the guy wasn't wrong you know you weren't it's just different thought processes ideologies behind wine which is what is unreal well i just think that australian riesling if you just had that wine with the dish, you probably would have enjoyed it. But because you had that wine and the wine that I'm recommending side by side, one's gonna win, one's not gonna win. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's an unfair comparison, you know, really. And the re- reality is the reason why I did the pairing wasn't because it, was, it wasn't Italian or the dish was Italian and this wine was German. It had nothing to do with that stuff. It really was back to the point of this, this podcast. It was about me trying to make an enjoyable pairing, mm-hmm. something that would taste good and you would totally enjoy it together. And you would sit there going, oh my God, look at this to create that, that excitement. You know, and, and again, that example of that pairing is the same message that I want to send on this podcast. What can I do? How can I help you to enjoy wines or enjoy wine and foods? That's the mission statement for this whole thing for me. That's mm-hmm. the important, that's what rings my bell. You know, and so uh, hopefully... You know, I'm hoping all you listeners will stay, stay tuned for the second podcast, you know, and the third and the fourth as we unveil this thing. And p- please feel free to email him. 
or comment it, below on, on what we post. And yeah. then, um, you know, let's let's talk story in the future. Let's have fun from doing this thing. You know, let's explore the world of wines from a very, very different perspective. And that's pure enjoyment. Mm -hmm. I okay? like that. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks, guys. See you guys I appreciate next week. it, man. Thank you. See you next week. Aloha. Mm -hmm.